Evening everyone. It is actually Thursday the 28th of May. Actually I'm recording this not on Thursday 28th of May but as I said on Tuesday I'll be pre-recording the Bible reading and reflection for this evening because I'm going to be involved in family birthday celebrations on the Thursday evening. But as I said we're going to continue our journey with Peter uh, as he discovers what it means to truly follow Jesus. And our passage this evening is Mark chapter two, chapter 9 and verses 2 to 13. Mark's accounts of the transfiguration. Now this happens immediately after uh, the events of the previous two talks. So there is a continuity there in Peter's experience. So let me pray and then I'll read the Bible to us. Father God, thank you that in your word we find your truth, we find your person, we find the, the things that you want us to know and understand and live by. We pray this evening by your spirit, you'd open our hearts and minds, that we may hear your voice and know how it applies to our life. We ask this in your name. Amen. So Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 13. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. He was so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then it is written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, as I said, Peter has been discovering what it truly means to follow Jesus. He's had that wonderful experience of declaring Jesus's authority and his identity as the, as the, as the Messiah. And then had the ignominy of Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan, when he said to Jesus, no, Lord, this is not the way it's meant to be. But you can imagine at the end of that slightly bruising encounter, Peter having the question in his mind, how could this Jesus really be the Messiah if the pathway that he's talking about is one of suffering and of death and of sacrifice? That's not the Messiah. Is he really the Messiah? Well, I think what happens next is that Jesus takes Peter and James and John, his inner circle. He takes them and gives them an experience, allows them to see something which leaves them in no doubt that he truly was God that he truly was God in all his glory and splendour. An event where they saw a foretaste of the future. Something we can share with as they will share with it. An event that would blast away the spiritual cobwebs and blow their doubts away. An encounter that would resonate with what they already knew. And an experience that would demonstrate that Jesus really was the Christ. And it's a passage rooted in Old Testament illusions and references which need explaining if we are to truly understand what is going on here. Because you see, there is a resonance with a particular moment in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 24. We read there that God takes Moses to a high mountain, Mount Sinai, where after a waiting period of six days, he speaks from his glory and reveals the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments and the law. A definitive revelation of truth direct from God to his people. 
And now here we have a new revolution, revelation of truth. New hearers, new Sinai, a new covenant. Jesus takes his inner circle after a wait of six days up a high mountain. And while they were there, what they would see and hear was God's definitive message to them that superseded and surpassed the events in Exodus. This truly was God's new covenant to them. And then whilst they're on the mountaintop, three extraordinary things happen. First of all, Jesus's appearance changes. Now, the only detail Mark gives us is that Jesus's clothes become dazzling white. But even then, Mark's words fail him. All he can say is they were whiter than the whitest white that we ever knew. And that has great significance from the Old Testament, because the overwhelming brilliance is a mark of heaven and of the person of God. And in that one moment, their whole understanding of Jesus is changed. He was more than a prophet or a great leader. He truly was God, clothed in divine glory, unapproachable in his holiness and his purity. The second thing that happened is that Elijah and Moses appear. And they were there to endorse the identity of Jesus. And there's great significance because Elijah, there was a common Jewish expectation that Elijah would appear in person to announce the arrival of the kingdom of God to prepare people for it. And now here was Elijah in person, talking with Jesus, endorsing him as the Messiah. In fact, Luke records in his accounts that they talked about Jesus' death and resurrection. In Jesus, the conclusion we came because Elijah was there, the kingdom of God had arrived. And then there's Moses, the greatest of all Old, Old Testament figures, the founder of Israel, the receiver of the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses promises that God would send a prophet after him, speaking God's words, who, were to, who was to be listened to carefully. A prophet of Moses-like stature, who would announce the arrival of the kingdom of God. And now here was Moses in person, endorsing Jesus as the one who he had promised, the one who bore all the authority of Moses in speaking for God. And in fact, the early Christians came to understand Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 as referring to and fulfilled in Jesus. And the third thing that happens is the voice from the cloud, the ultimate confirmation of the glory and the identity of Jesus. The cloud symbolises the presence of God, the manifestation of his glory. And on Sinai, Mount Sinai, God spoke to Moses from the cloud. Definitive revelation. And here God speaks to the disciples from the cloud. Definitive revelation. What is to be said is to be listened to and acted on. And what is said confirms Jesus' supremacy and authority. He is God's beloved son, superior and greater to anyone or anything else. Upon him rests unparalleled glory and divine presence. In Jesus, God has revealed himself ultimately and definitively. There is no need for God to say anything more about his person and his character. And as there is nothing more to say, there can only be one command. Listen to him. So these three events together bring a climactic end. Suddenly, all they saw was Jesus there with them, the Jesus they'd come up the mountain with. Everything was the same, but actually everything was different. The message could not be clearer to them and to us. Jesus is the glory of God. Jesus brings God's kingdom. Jesus is God. And then actually what's interesting is what doesn't happen next. At that moment, we should be eternally grateful that something doesn't happen. Something that Peter suggests should happen. Something that wouldn't have been out of place. The end credits roll. The stirring music rises. And suddenly everything comes to a conclusion. What a climax to Jesus' mission and ministry, to the story of the disciples. What, a, what an ending 
to their journey to be fully and completely aware that Jesus truly was God, God himself. Jesus glorified, God's affirmation, the disciples' worship, the endorsement of Elijah and Moses. What more could be added to this? Surely Peter had the right idea. Let's preserve the moment. Let's stay at this particular time. Let's just stay here because how could it get any better than this to be in God's glorious presence? This is good as it's ever going to get. Why do we want to go anywhere else? Especially, why go down there to the sin and the mess and the chaos of the world in which they knew so well? But what does happen is this. They do go down the mountain. But why? Why do they go down the mountain? Why don't they stay as Peter suggested they should? Because if they didn't, then God's salvation plan would have been incomplete and it would have failed because Jesus's ministry would have been left unfinished. You see, God's salvation plan and Jesus's path to glory go direct through the cross and the resurrection. Without the cross and the resurrection, without Jesus' death and rising again, there is no gospel message. There is no good news. There is no hope of eternity. There is no relationship with God. The disciples got it wrong about Jesus at that moment, and so do we if the Jesus we believe in stays on the mountaintop. Because the ultimate glory of Jesus is not found on the mountaintop. It's found at the cross in his death and resurrection. And if it doesn't, then any preaching, any any, um, devotion, any study will be like the disciples at that moment, shallow, confused and simply wrong. The only way you can make any sense of Jesus' mission and ministry is when you focus on the cross. And our only hope of sharing in his glory is by taking the same path that he did and focusing on the cross. As Jesus said, referring back to our last Bible reading, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. The path of following Jesus does sometimes go over the mountaintops but more often it's it's actually lived out in the valley in the place of sin of confusion of doubt and of uncertainty and we'll see that in what happens immediately afterwards something that Peter would have experienced as one of the disciples something that reinforces that the true ministry of Jesus is found on the valley floor, in the sinfulness and the evil and the chaos of, 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 of our lives, of everyday life. But the reason he walked on the valley floor was because he wants us to be with him on the mountaintops. So therefore, this is something that Peter and James and John experienced, particularly Peter. They saw a glimpse of Jesus in his true glory. But we should be so thankful that they didn't do what Peter wanted. They didn't stay there because you see the cross was actually at Jerusalem, down on the valley floor. And because Jesus went to the cross, we one day can look forward to being eternally on the mountaintop with him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you as we read this particular passage, this extraordinary event. Thank you for what it tells us about Jesus' person, his presence, his identity. We can identify with Peter being so frightened he didn't know what to say, what to say, he just wanted to stay there. But help us to understand that your mission, your ministry, your work is actually found in the chaos of everyday life here on earth. Help us to be thankful that you are the King, that you are the Lord, but help us to be willing to trust you so that we follow you wherever you lead us, directly to the cross. We ask this in your name. Amen. 
Thanks for joining me this evening. Uh, don't forget this coming Saturday and Sunday is our special birthday weekend. We're having a quiz night at 7.30 on our YouTube channel. And then on Sunday morning at 10.30, a, a special guest service, particularly encouraging people to invite their friends and their neighbours and their relatives to uh, come and be part of the live stream service with us. And then at 6.30 on Sunday evening, we have the first of our new Alpha course, Alpha Online, the Taster Session. All the information you can find on the live bulletins that have been sent out by Alice. If you haven't got that information, do email me or email the office. We'll be happy to let you know what it is. But please pray that this weekend will be a great opportunity for people to discover more about Jesus and the Christian faith. So have a great evening and I'll see you again soon. God bless you.